أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والدين والزيتون وطور سنين وهذا البلد اللمين والدين والزيطون وطور سنين وهذا البلد الأمين لقد خلقنا الإنسان في أحسن تقويم ثم رددناه أسفل سافلين إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات فلهم أجر غير من فما يكذبك بعد بالدين أليس الله بأحكم الحاكمين صدق الله العظيم الله يا رسول الله 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 يا رسول الله يا رحمة لعباد الله ويا ملاذ يوم الله انظر إلينا عطفا علينا انظر إلينا واعطف علينا نحن أسأنا نحن جنينا لولاك يا أحمد ما بقينا لذ بالرسول باب الوصول لذ بالرسول باب الوصول به تنال كل Up.
باب الاله الاوحد صلوا عليه ورددوا صلوا عليه ورددوا تجد الهنا وتسعدوا تجد الهنا وتسعدوا يا رب على ونسلم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد رسوله النبي الأمين المكين الحنين الكريم اللؤف الرحيم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Respected شيوخ and dear brothers and sisters and sons and daughters alhamdulillah ta'ala by the grace of almighty allah we are starting our series of lectures on hadith the first lecture of this series would be inshallah ta'ala on usul al hadith the basic principles of the science of hadith when we use the term hadith there are many people who do not properly and correctly understand that what this term hadith signifies for and what does it mean hadith and sunnah without going into the depth of technicalities just broadly speaking these both words are used synonymously they imply and signify the same concept although a technical difference by some of the scholars have been made between sunnah and hadith but for all practical purposes sunna and hadith is taken as the same because both refer to the speech of holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or act of holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and silent or tacit approvals of holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam so hadith would be qauli or fi'li or taqriri sunnah normally 
reference to the practice of Holy Prophet وسلم, but in broader spectrum they are used as one and the same thing. When we talk of hadith, many people are not clear about the exact meaning and implication of this term. Except the scholars and ulama who are well acquainted, acquainted with this knowledge and this science. There are two parts of hadith. The first part of hadith is known as Isnad. Second part of hadith is known as Matam. Isnad is the chain of transmitters. It is a series of certain names of the reporters, of the transmitters. It starts from the companion of Holy Prophet وسلم, to the compiler of the book of Hadith. So this Isnad technically and uh, literally it is it means support This first part, the chain of transmitters is Isnad or Sanad. And the second part, when the Sanad or Isnad comes to its end, then the last or second part of Hadith is the text of the Holy Prophet Wasallam's speech. If Holy Prophet's speech his utterance has been narrated. If his act has been narrated and reported, that will become the text. If he something was done and performed in front of him, or something was said in front of him and he heard it, he knew it, he saw it, and remained silent, so his silence becomes the tacit approval of that act and it becomes the hadith of Holy Prophet وسلم, through his silent approval. So if his tacit approval is mentioned, so that would become the text of hadith. So one portion, the first portion or part of hadith is the chain of transmitters, sanad or isnad, and the second part of hadith is matan, the text the statement. So these both things together constitute hadith. This is one aspect. But in the science of hadith, the scholars and the scientists and the authorities of hadith Mostly they have been using the term hadith for isnad. For example, if the same text was reported and transmitted by various transmitters, there were ten companions who heard something from Holy Prophet وسلم, and all of them transmitted it, reported it. And that report was received by Tabi'een, the successor, their companions. So they reported the same hadith to the next generation. So the now number of reporters has increased because, for example, if Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu is the first transmitter of a hadith of Holy Prophet wasallam. And maybe there were eight or ten tabi'een successors who heard from him 
some of them from were from Medina, some of them maybe were from Mecca, some of them maybe were from Kufa, some of them maybe were from Basra, some of them maybe from Yemen. from other countries, other parts of the world. So all of them went back to their homelands, to their cities, and to their countries. And they reported and transmitted the same hadith to their students. So in this way, the number of transmitters was multiplied. And then their students reported and transmitted the same hadith to their students. Tab'ut-Tabi'in. The successors of Tabi'in. The companions of Tabi'in. So by that time, the number, those who heard, those who received that hadith from Tabi'in, had already increased. And when they transmitted that particular hadith to their students, then the number was further increased. So now the chains are coming into existence. So somebody is receiving the same text of Holy Prophet Sallallahu utterance, his speech, his act, his approval, the same text, maybe with some difference of words. Somebody is receiving through this chain, he is sitting in Syria, and he is receiving through the chain of Shami Jin. Some of the transmitters are from Sham, some maybe from Mecca, some from Medina. Somebody received the same hadith in Kufa. It can be a different chain. Somebody received the same hadith in Basra. It can be a different chain. So, in this way, the chains were increasing but the text sometimes remained the same. Sometimes there was a bit difference of wordings. Sometimes there was a little bit increase. Sometimes little bit decrease. Whatever they received from their shiyukh. So the scholars and the scientists, the authorities of the usulul hadith, they will regard because of the large number of chains, they will say that there are some, such many ahadith on this subject. They won't say that this is one hadith. They will enumerate all chains of transmitters for the same text, sometimes without any difference of words, and most of the time, a little bit difference in the text. But they will say that on this subject, there are many ahadiths. There are 10 ahadiths, 20 ahadiths, 30 ahadiths. So how they count? They are counting the number of hadiths because of the number of chains of transmitters. Sometimes the text, when we count the text, the number becomes smaller. When we count the chains, the number becomes bigger. This is how the numbers of hadith used to be counted in those days. So most of the scholars always have been using the word hadith on isnad. And there is a difference, practical difference, in methodology, in way of transmitting a hadith between Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, Sahih. Imam Bukhari quotes a hadith according to Tarjimatul Bab, according to the heading of the chapter. And it is there is a possibility that many subjects have been covered in one text. So he brings the same hadith under this chapter to establish that particular fact, that particular legal fact, that particular legal opinion, that particular uh, concept which he has already mentioned as the heading, as the title of that chapter. He will bring the same hadith over there 
and there is some other point also covered some other subject also covered in the same text so for that particular portion he will bring the same hadith again in second chapter and there can be another third subject also mentioned in the same text so he will bring the same hadith in order to establish the third chapter the third fact the third subject to prove it as an evidence he will bring the same hadith third time so he brings sometimes one hadith seven times in his book al jami as sahih sometimes 10 times sometimes 15 times so he goes on repeating because of the variety of subjects covered in one text of hadith so you don't find all ahadith with different chains or all ahadith with a little bit difference or increase or decrease or addition or deletion in the text at the in the same one chapter in bukhari you will find them at in various chapters they are scattered whereas imam muslim collects all of those ahadees together at one place he does not put and place the same hadees maybe with different chains in various chapters if he received a hadees through various chains with difference of text or without difference of text so he put all these chains of ahadees and he would say ahadees together in one chapter so this way it has been unanimously accepted that as far as the level of saha as far as the grade the status the quality is concerned bukhari sahi al bukhari possesses a comparatively a higher status than sahi muslim although both are sahi authoritatively both are known to be authentic every hadith which has been taken by bukhari and muslim in their jami that is definitely positively sahi but as far as the arrangement is concerned the order is concerned it is stated that in arrangement of the book and the order of book and sequence of book and combining and collecting all relevant ahadith in a single chapter at one place for this purpose muslim is better than sahih bukhari in saha bukhari is afdal in tartib husn at tartib the arrangement and order muslim is better to understand to read you get all relevant ahadith at a single place you don't need to collect the scattered ahadith from various chapters and they count all those ahadith they count because on basis of the chains basis of the chains the chain of transmission is known to be hadith and this is one of the basic and fundamental principles of science of hadith unanimously agreed upon and there is no dispute on this point among the authorities that whenever they say that this is sahih or they say this is daif the word sahih or word daif normally does not refer to the text they don't say about the text that this is sahih or this is daif whenever they say sahih it means haza sahih ul isnad its sanad is sahih and if they say this is daif so daif is a quality of sanad not the quality or characteristic of matan it means they would say this is daif ul isnad and the aima of hadith they say that there is every possibility 
that there is a da'af, a weakness in the chain, it is da'if in its isnad, and it is sahih in its matan. It can be da'if in isnad, but sahih in its matan. So in spite of being da'af, weakness in isnad, in chain, even then it is acceptable, makbur and sahih as far as the matan is concerned. So they have mentioned certain conditions to evaluate this thing and appreciate this thing. So the word sahih and word da'if is not related to matan. The statement, the text, the subject matter. No. Subject matter in spite of being daif al isnad can be sahih. That's why this subject came under discussion. So, we will discuss today the difference and the legal effect of Hadith as sahih al-Hasan, al-Da'if, al Maudu, and certain other important relevant aspects of Zulul Hadith this night to understand the basics of science of Hadith. Not many people who possess just superficial knowledge, they lack the depth in classical knowledge and depth in the knowledge of science of Hadith. They create a mess, they create a confusion, they create misunderstandings, they are misled and they mislead the people too. And in nowadays, it has become very easy to say any hadith which is not supporting your aqeedah, they will say this is da'if. It has become very easy. Any hadith which is not supporting your aqeedah, they will say this is da'if. Finish. And the people don't know what does da'if mean. There are 15 kinds of da'if. And according to some of the scholars, there are 39 and 40 kinds of 40 kinds of da'if. Hadith ad da'if. And according to some of the scholars, there are about 72 kinds of al hadith ad da'if. And some say there are 80 kinds of al-hadith of da'if. So saying da'if does not mean that this should be rejected. This cannot accept it. There is no sense behind this idea. But the people who are not well versed in this classical science of usul al-hadith, they always get benefit of the ignorance of people. And the word Daif, they have made a very big deal. And if they want to reject any hadith, they would just say, this is Daif. And they don't know what does it mean. What would be the legal effect of word Daif? Whether it should be accepted or not. Whether it is receivable or not. This is the subject which we are going to study tonight. So, when the books were being compiled, books of hadith were being compiled for Jami as sahid al-Bukhari and al-Jami as sahid al-Muslim, they were compiled approximately 100 collections of ahadith were already prepared and ready. Before Jami as sahid al-Bukhari, the people say that we don't accept hadith, we don't rely on hadith. We just rely on Quran. This is one of the greatest fitna, misleading and misguiding fitna in deen. And this is the biggest jihala and dalala to say we don't rely on hadith. Why? Because they were compiled two, three hundred years after the death of Holy Prophet This is totally jihala and dalala. Ahadith were not compiled two or three centuries after the demise of Holy Prophet Ahadith were compiled in front of Holy Prophet 
in the days of holy prophet in the days of the companions in the days of their successors then in the days of their successors al bukhari and al muslim or as siha sitta doesn't mean this term doesn't mean that they were the first books of hadith or the first collections or compilations of hadith which appeared in the history of islam no approximately 100 collections of hadith were already existing when imam bukhari compiled his book and imam muslim compiled his sahih 100 books of hadith and collections written manuscripts they were already existing before bukhari and muslim so these were the books which were filling the gap there was no gap and there was never any gap between the period of holy prophet and the period of bukhari and muslim in compilation of hadith at the same time when hadith was being compiled the science of isnad the science of jarh ta'dil the science of scrutinization of the chains of transmitters and the science of criticism of the transmitters who are the reliable transmitters who are unreliable transmitters what would be their grade where they would be placed so this ilm al asani the ilm al isnad or ilm al jarh wa ta'dil all these things and after that ilm asma ar rijal all these basic sciences basic branches of the science of hadith were also coming into existence and were also being compiled side by side when the books and collections of hadith were being prepared the aima and the great authorities of those centuries were very particular in the case of hadith and they became more particular when the fitna of fabrication of hadith started fabrication wadul hadith when this fitna started they became much more particular and careful although they were careful before too the reason was that holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam stated man haddatha anni bi hadithin yura annahu kadhibun fa huwa ahadul kadhibin this hadith has been reported by imam muslim in his muqaddimah of al jami as sahih and holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam stated la takdhibu alayya fa innahu man yakdhib alayya yalij an-nar holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam stated man ta'amada alayya kadhiban fal yatabawwa maqadahu min an-nar so there were many hadith maybe about about 60 companions have reported this hadith from holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so these ahadith of holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam became the basis of science of hadith hadith of holy prophet itself man kadhaba alayya mutamidan fal yatabawwa maqadahu min an-nar these are the ahadith of holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which became the basis of science of hadith in the light of these ahadith the successors and their successors felt a need to scrutinize the chain and to establish a science to scrutinize the chain of transmitters and to criticize their transmissions and to establish through which chain and through which source hadith of holy prophet should be accepted and through which source it should be not so these ahadith became the i am i have started now 
that holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam own ahadith became the basis of usulul hadith in the same way his own ahadith became the basis of compilation of hadith if you read kitabul ilm of al jami as sahih lil bukhari kitabul ilm imam bukhari has quoted many ahadith and imam muslim has also quoted many ahadith whereby holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam commanded to write down his hadith or sometimes he asked the companions to write a particular hadith or his particular statements or speech which he delivered in a particular meeting for certain people uktubu li abi shah sometimes he was asked and he granted permission to transcribe ahadith in front of him so the process of compilation of hadith is also based on the hadith of holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam itself so compilation of hadith is also sunna tadwin ul hadith kitabat ul hadith tadwin ul hadith is sunna transcribing hadith writing down the hadith collecting hadith compilation of hadith this act which was performed by aimma itself is sunna you may say how because i have already explained sunna does not mean just his own holy prophet's act sunna comprises his acts his commandments his speeches his instructions and his tacit approvals so whatever he uttered whatever he ordered whatever he said whatever he instructed whatever he commanded that is sunna and that is hadith whatever he performed whatever he act acted whatever he practiced that is sunna and hadith and whatever some other person did in front of it in front of him whatever some other person performed in front of him some whatever any act some other person performed in his meeting in his presence he saw it and he remained silent so through this tacit approval it also became his sunna so holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ordered to write down his hadith he said qayyidul ilm bil kitab so it became sunna of holy prophet i am referring to those the thoughts and ideas of those people who just want to get rid of authentic or rid of authoritativeness of hadith just on the basis of this wrong conception that this is a thing which was done centuries after the death of holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam no this was done in the presence of holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam under his own instruction under his own supervision and there were many companions who had prepared their own sahaif sayyidina ali it comes in sahih bukhari in sahih bukhari kitabul ilm somebody asked sayyidina ali do you have some compiled knowledge do you have anything any booklet or any book with you which contains ilm he said yes he said this is a sahifa which contains three things this comes in kitabul ilm jami as sahih al bukhari sayyidin ali radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu is stating he showed his own book which he had written which he had transcribed said this is my book my sahifa sahifa sayyidin ali and it contains three kinds of knowledge how many kinds number one kitabullah one number two whatever i heard from holy prophet is hadith and number three he says and the faham the reasoning and understanding which i derived from quran and sunna or kama qal so he said that my this book contains three sources of knowledge 
Quran and Sunnah of Holy Prophet and Faham. And this Faham was Al Fiqh. So this Hadith becomes the basis of the three basic sources of Sharia. Three basic sources of Sharia. Faham, which I derived from Quran, text of Quran and Sunnah. So Quran became the first source of the Ahkam of Sharia. Sunnah and Hadith became the second source of Ahkam of Sharia. And the word Faham which I derived from Quran and Sunnah through logical deduction, through reasoning, through my understanding, that became the basis of Al-Fiqh and basis of Ijtihad. And through this source in the light of Quran and Sunnah, Al-Fiqh went on developing. So Al-Fiqh itself is Sunnah. So the basic thing which I wanted to explain that compilation, collection and compilation of Hadith is Sunnah of Holy Prophet because he himself commanded for that. And in the same way, the Usulul Hadith is also Sunnah of Holy Prophet because he himself said that don't allow anybody to tell lie about me. This became the basis of Usulul Hadith. That's why the great Aimma Tabi'een, but after Sahaba Tabi'een and Tabu Tabi'een, all these great scholars, they established the science of Isnad. And this was a branch of science of Hadith. And science of Isnad means science of the chain of transmitters. And they said, as reported by Imam Muhammad bin Siri, one of the great successors, Tabi'een, and related by Imam Muslim in Muqaddimah of al jami as sahih al-Muslim. Imam Muhammad bin Siri stated, Qala inna hadha al-ilma, ay ilm al-isnad. Because Imam Muslim has brought a chapter here, Bayanu anna al-isnad min ad deen This is Imam Muslim saying, anna al-isnad min ad deen Isnad, the chain of transmissions, this itself is deen and this is a part of deen. And anna riwayah la takuna illa anis siqat. And the transmission should only be through the trustworthy and reliable people, transmitters. So under this chapter, Imam Muslim quotes, In Nahaz al-ilma, this science is a part of deen. فَنْظُرُوا أَمَّنْ تَأْخُذُونَ دِينَكُمْ Now this is very important. He has not said here that the text, a very important nukta, a point. Imam Ibn Siri has not stated and Imam Muslim has not reported that just the text of Hadith is deen. Because the text of Hadith is particularly only the subject which was given to the Ummah by Holy Prophet sallallahu and not the chain of transmitters. Holy Prophet did not give the chain of transmitters to us. This is a chain, this is a series of various reliable people who just transmitted the sayings of Holy Prophet to us. Who reported and related the acts and practices and approvals of Holy Prophet to us. They are the conveyors. They were the communicators. They were the transmitters. They were the reporters. They were the relators. What was being transmitted by them? The teachings of Holy Prophet sallallahu al hadith. So common sense says that Imam Ibn Siri would have said that the text of Hadith is Deen because this is in fact what has been stated by Holy Prophet that is Deen but Imam Ibn Siri has not said this thing 
and same is reported by Imam Abdullah bin Mubarak and many others. The great Tabi stated, not the text, text of course is deen, the text of course it is deen, it is sunnah, it is the second fundamental source of deen. But Imam ibn Siri is saying that the chain of transmitter, this is deen, this is part of deen. And what is the chain of transmitter? Chain of transmitter consists of certain personalities and not the saying of Holy Prophet. Chain of transmitter does not consist of the act of Holy Prophet. Chain of narrators, the isnad, does not consist of the practices and the speeches and the approvals of Holy Prophet. Chain of narrator is a series of certain persons, personalities. And Imam Ibn Siri is saying that this chain of certain personalities, knowledge of these personalities, this is part of deen. Knowledge of the certain personalities who became the transmitters and communicators of Holy Prophet's hadith to us. Their knowledge is a part of deen. It, so it means those persons who say we don't believe in personalities. Those who say we don't believe in personalities. We just believe in Kalamullah. We just believe in Allah's commandment. And we just believe in hadith. Hadith means whatever Holy Prophet said. We just believe in commands of Allah and commands of hadith. Prophet. That's it. So they are wrong. Because the Tabi'in, their Aqeedah is that, the, that just the chain of transmitter is also a part of Deen. The study, studying the lives of the great and pious people, those who became the transmitters of Deen, it is also a part of Deen. And then why it is said, You should look into the matter that whom you are receiving the deen from whom you are receiving the teachings from here is al-akhz wal-ijaza al-riwaya al-akhz as-sama you should look into the matter whom you are getting the deen and an-nasiha from if he is a reliable person and if he is a trustworthy only then what he has transmitted should be accepted. It means in Islam, the personalities are no less important than the text of teachings. Because the correctness or incorrectness of the teachings, what has been conveyed and communicated to you and to us, that depends upon the reliability and truthfulness of the transmitters and they are personalities. So Imam Ibn Siri again stated he says قَالَ لَمْ يَكُونُوا يَسْأَلُونَ عَنِ الْإِسْنَادِ before the fitna occurred of Wadul Hadith and the political wars and group, political groupings and these problems take place and there became political influences in fabrication, these became the factors in fabrication of hadith. Before this fitna took place, they say we were not so much careful or so much particular about asking the isnad because all people before that time were trustworthy, they were reliable. Falamma waqaatil fitna, kalu sammu lana rijalakum. Then we used to ask, tell us the names of the transmitters. For yunzaru ila ahli sunnah. This is the term, not created by you and not created by me. This is a term which is coming from Tabi'een and it is coming from Holy Prophet and companions themselves. And I am quoting from Sahih Muslim. And he is quoting Imam ibn Siri. Said, فَيُنْزَرُوا إِلَىٰ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ فَيُؤْخَذُوا حَدِيثُهُمْ 
we used to see if the transmitter was from among ahlu sunna then his hadith was accepted wa yunzaru ila ahli al bid'ah fala yukhazu hadithuhum and if he was from ahlu al bid'ah then his hadith his narration was rejected so it means some people say that these are these ahlu sunna and these are bid'atis and they are bid'ati it means bid'ah is not something create which has been created or manufactured in india bid'ah is coming from the days of successors of companions from days of tabi'in those who say the celebration of maulid is bid'ah this is bid'ah this is bid'ah and they have created a new aqeedah and they have created new practices and they are introduced and innovated new things in deen so these are the ahlul bid'ah you should keep in your mind that bid'ah is not something new which has come into existence through india or through syria or through pakistan bid'ah according to imam muslim rather according to imam muhammad bin siri the great tabi students of great companions of sahaba he is saying that in our days there used to be ahlu sunna and ahlu bid'ah and we used to accept the hadith and narration transmitted by ahlu sunna and we used to reject the tra- transmission reported by ahlu bid'ah and the same things were reported by sufyan bin uyayna and the same things were given by imam abdullah bin mubarak he said al isnadu min ad din walau lal isnadu laqala man sha ama sha if there was no chain of authority the chain of transmission then everybody would have exercised in an absolute freedom to say whatever he want to say so he would have corrupted the whole subject of deen so if deen is intact if deen is protected from corruption that is just due to the pious personalities this is what imam abdullah bin mubarak has said and imam muslim has reported if deen is protected from corruption is deen is protected from distortion if deen is protected from additions and alterations if deen is maintain in its original and pure form so this neema is due to the pious personalities of this ummah so it means that protection of deen depends upon the pious personalities of ummah and here our view the fitna which has occurred in our time that fitna says that no need of referring to the pious personalities they are personalities just we consider allah and his prophet quran and hadith and nothing else who provided you the hadith of holy prophet who reported you the hadith of holy prophet did holy prophet himself transmitted his hadith to us or his hadith was transmitted to us through a long chain of transmitters where lies the burden of reliance on chain of transmitters and what is the chain of transmitters the text or the persons persons it means whole credibility of the teachings of deen depends upon the credibility of the personalities this is the meaning of shuyukh this is the meaning of aimma this is the meaning of authorities this is the meaning of awliya and this is the meaning of muhad muhaddisin and mujtahidin so this is a fitna of this time to say we don't bother about the personalities we just accept the quran and hadith the question is imam bukhari was not a personality or he was he prophet what was imam bukhari a prophet or a person of from the umma of holy prophet imam muslim was a prophet or a person from umma of holy prophet what was imam abu daud what was imam tirmizi all these were personalities those who were engaged 
in collecting the transmissions of holy prophets hadith so if you accept and rely upon sahih bukhari it means you are relying upon a person you understand my point if you are relying on al jami as sahih lil bukhari and you say we just accept bukhari okay you accept bukhari but the question is whether you are relying on holy prophet or you are relying on a person of the umma of holy prophet you say every hadith in bukhari and we accept that is sahih why because we accept the credibility of imam bukhari of imam muslim we believe in his credibility we believe in his authenticity we believe in his reliability since he is one of the reliable and authentic personalities of the umma of holy prophet that's why we accept as sahih bukhari so it means again coming back to the same point basic reliance is on the personalities when you talk of sahih muslim you talk of the reliability on a person when you talk on sunan abi daud it means you are talking about the reliability on a person when you talk of asha as sitta you are talking on the rely about the reliability of six great personalities when you talk of imam ahmad bin hanbal you are talking of reliability on a person when you talk of imam shafi radiyallahu ta'ala anhu you are speaking about reliability on a person when you talk of imam malik you are speaking about the reliability on a person when you talk of imam e azam abu hanifa you are talking the reliance on a person so you can't get you can't get rid of personalities everywhere you find personalities and they are protecting the deen of holy prophet they are transmitting the deen they are protecting the deen they are communicating the deen so you can't get rid of the personalities that's why almighty allah ordered in surah al fatiha ihdin as sirat al mustaqim sirat al ladina an'amta alaihim the straight path almighty allah would have said he would have said the straight path means the path of my book the path of quran or the path of the sunnah of my prophet he would have stated like this but the first chapter of holy quran doesn't say that the straight path is the path of quran and straight path is the path of hadith and sunnah although quran and sunnah is the straight path but quran has not given us this message quran has said sirat al ladina an'amta alaihim straight path is the path of the blessed people of the blessed personalities so this is the first lesson of the first chapter of quran try to follow the blessed personalities so quran is referring you to the personalities and when we say we don't bother about the personalities we just talk about quran it means you are negating quran so this knowledge came into existence in those days and there were scholars who became the founders of science of hadith among them what imam zuhri i'm just quoting some a few names very few names among them were malik bin anas the imam of ahl madina those who became the founder of science of hadith i'm not talking of the compilation of hadith the books no the science of hadith usulul hadith Shuwa bin al Hajjaj, Sufyan bin Uyayna, Yahya bin Sa'id al Qattan, Abdul Rahman bin Mahdi, Imam Ahmad bin Hambal, Ali bin Abdullah al Madini, Yahya bin Sa'id, I have already quoted, Imam Muhammad bin Siri, in Kufa Imam Ibrahim al Nakhi, Imam al Qama. Isaac bin Mansur Imam Auzai Ma'mar Sufyan Al-Thawri Suleiman bin Katsir 
So all these scholars in early days, much earlier than Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim came, they became the founders of the science of Hadith. They became the founders of science of Hadith. I quoted all these references, the initial talk from Muqaddima of Imam Muslim's Jami as Sahih. So, in the same way, the, the science of Hadith has its own history, like every other subject and every other science of Deen. As the books of Hadith were compiled, and I told there were 100 compilations of Hadith, collections of Hadith, which existed before Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim's works. In the same way, the books were written on Usulul Hadith, and the basic principles of the science of Hadith were laid down. And Imam Shafi'i is known to be the first scholar and the first scientist of Usulul Hadith and the first authority who compiled the basic principles of Hadith, science of Hadith. In his book, Ar Risala. And he discussed Imam Shafi, radiallahu ta'ala, he discussed the conditions of the acceptability of Hadith, which is isolated, Khabrul Wahid, Al Khabrul Wahid, the conditions of acceptability of Riwayah, and the matter of Tadlis. And the adala of transmitter, the trustworthiness of, trans, of a transmitter, reliability of the transmitter, certain basic principles and things related to the ilmul riwaya, ilmul isnad, was discussed by Imam Shafi'i radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he became the founder of science of hadith. Imam Bukhari did not do an exclusive and elaborate work on Usulul Hadith. Whatever he compiled in his al jami as sahih at various places, he gave his own opinions and he mentioned certain principles of Usulul Hadith in various chapters of al jami as sahih He didn't compile a separate book except one book known as ad duafa which was written by Imam Bukhari. Otherwise, he mentioned various principles in various abwab, various chapters of Sahih Bukhari. Then Imam Muslim among the six Aimma is the first person after Imam Bukhari who wrote a full-fledged preface, muqaddima on Usulul Hadith. So Sayyid Bukhari does not possess muqaddimah on usulul hadith. Sayyid Muslim has a muqaddimah. Imam Muslim starts with a muqaddimah. A very comprehensive preface and that consists of usulul hadith. And I quoted certain statements from the same muqaddimah. <laughs> then he made certain categories of the transmitters and their etiquettes and the significance of the chain of narrators, chain of transmitters and certain other technical matters related to the Ilmul Riwaya, Ilmul Isnad was also discussed by Imam Muslim. Then Imam Tirmazi radiallahu ta'ala anhu he wrote a booklet, a risala, Kitabul Ilal and he is reported to have compiled two books, Al-Ilal al-Saghir and Al-Ilal al-Kabir. But Al-Ilal al-Saghir is available in the end of the Jami Jami al-Tirmazi. And before him, Imam Abu Dawood al-Sajistani, 
بیکاز آئی ٹولڈ دیٹ امام ابو داؤد سجستانی از شیخ آف امام ترمزی آلسو اینڈ ہی از کراس فیلو اینڈ کلیگ آف امام بخاری اینڈ امام مسلم ہی رولڈ رسالہ رسالہ الا اہل مکہ And he mentioned and discussed certain principles of hadith in that risala, introducing his own book, Sunan Abi Dawud. And these principles were related to his own book. A Sunan. And you should never forget that according to Shah Abdul Aziz Dehlavi and according to many other muhaddisin and muarrikhin, they say that Imam Abu Dawud as Sajistani Sajistan was on the border of Afghanistan and India and Pakistan. There was a series of mountains which starts from Afghanistan, goes to the, enters into the boundaries of India. And most of the scholars say that this Sajistan was anywhere in those mountains, this village. So Imam Abu Dawood, the Sajistani was neighbor of Pakistan and India. And he belonged to Afghanistan. I have already explained and the rest of the Aima of Hadith were from most of them from Iran and Central Asian states. Another, sometimes some, there is another fitna. They say that if anything is mentioned in connection of India and Pakistan, there are some people, they just, on the name of India and Pakistan, they just reject it. All of these Aima were known Arabs. who propagated deen and who created ilm. And India has been one of the greatest seeds of learning and science of Hadith. Because in very, very early days, there was a connection between the companions with India. The first army, the first soldiers, the companions, they entered into the boundaries of Lahore. in 41 of Hijrah. Just 31 years after the death of Holy Prophet وسلم, and this was the first year of the government of Umayyad, Umayyad's government. Only one year after the uh, end of Khilafah al-Rashidah. In 41 I am talking. In 41 the companion Sahaba of Holy Prophet وسلم, and the Tabi'een, they in the form of army, they entered into the boundaries of Lahore. And much before that, in 16, during the days of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anuh, the companions of Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I am talking of 16, just six years after Holy Prophet's death, demise. In the period of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the first army of Islam under the command of Abdullah Amr bin al-As, they entered into the boundaries of present, present day Pakistan. Although this name was not there, this, the whole of this part was India. But through Iraq and Iran and through Balochistan and Khuzdar, they entered into the boundaries and territory of Pakistan and they came up to Karachi and Sindh 16 Hijra this is not matter of Muhammad bin Qasim although he entered here and came in 94 but this was not first contact of companions with Indian subcontinent when he came he just established the Islamic government and Islamic state He established the Islamic State and Islamic government. But the first contact of companions of Holy Prophet with Indian subcontinent took place in 16 Hijra. In the early days of Caliphate, Orthodox Caliphate. And before that, five companions, Sahaba were sent by Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, were sent for propagation of Islam to present day Pakistan, I mean Sindh. Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent some companions for Islamic preaching. So 
So there were many great Imams belonging to this part of the world. Then Imam Abu Bayt Qasim bin Salam, who died in 224, he wrote Gharibul Hadith. Then Imam Abi Hatim Muhammad bin Hibban al Musti, he wrote a Siqat, books written on Usulul Hadith. Then Imam Nasai wrote a Duafa. And then so on and so forth. Imam Tahawi, he mentioned like Imam Bukhari, various principles of Hadith, Usulul Hadith, in his book, Mushkilul Asar and other books, in various chapters. Imam Ali bin Abdullah al Madini wrote Kitab al Ilal. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal wrote al Ilal wa Marifatul Rijal. Imam Ibn Hatim Razi wrote on al Jarha wa Ta'adil. Qazi Abu Muhammad al Hassan al Rama Hurmuzi he wrote a book on Usulul Hadith, the first very comprehensive book on Usulul Hadith. That was Al Muhaddisul Fasil bain al Rabi wal Bai. Then Imam Hakim Abu Abdullah an Nasapuri, he wrote a very great compendium of Usulul Hadith, Marifatu Ulum al Hadith, and again a precise book, Al Madhal ila Marifat Kitab al Iklil, Imam Hakim wrote, and a big voluminous book, Marifat Ulum al Hadith. Then Imam Abu Nuaym al Asfahani wrote on the same subject, then Khatib Baghdadi wrote on the same subject, and he wrote Al Kifaya. And he wrote Al Jami li Akhlaq al Rabi wa Adab al Sami'. Then comes Al Imam Al Qadi Iyaz rahimahullah Taala, Sahib al Shifa. He wrote Al Ilma. This was a great book as a source of Usul al Hadith knowledge in Usul al Hadith. And after Qadi Iyaz rahmatullah Taala comes Imam Ibn Salah. Who wrote Ulum al Hadith and who wrote Al Muqaddimah ibn al Salah, which, is, which was accepted afterwards as one of the basic texts of Usul al Hadith? He came after Qazi Ayaz and he benefited from Imam Qazi Ayaz al Ilma. This became the, one of the basic text of Usul al historical text of Usul al Hadith. And Imam Nabawi then summarized this, his book. Ulum al Hadith and his Muqaddimah in Irshadu Tullab al Haqaiq. Imam Nabawi, then he summarized the book of Ibn Salah. Irshadu Tullab al Haqaiq. He prepared a summary of Ulum al Hadith of Ibn Salah and he prepared another summary of his own book, Irshadu Tullab al Haqaiq, known as At Taqreeb. At Taqreeb and Imam Siyuti wrote a commentary on At Taqreeb known as At Tadreeb Tadreeb ur Ravi fi Sharh Taqreeb bin Nawawi. This Imam Siyuti wrote commentary on At Taqreeb and this was the summary of Imam Ibn Salah. These were the authorities of Usulul Hadith. Now I will tell why I am mentioning the names of these scholars, these authorities and their books. The reason is that whenever comes the matter of Hadith, whenever comes the matter of acceptability of Hadith, whenever comes the matter of credibility of chain of transmission, whenever comes the matter of Sahih, Daif, Modu and all these relevant things, you have to rely upon the statements and verdicts of these great Imams. Because these are the authorities on the science of Hadith. Then the dozens of books were written as a summary of Imam Ibn Salah. As a summary on Imam Ibn Salah. All Aimma and authorities of science of Hadith who came after him, they went on summarizing just his book and maximum books and works on Usul al-Hadith which were done after him, they were just based on Ibn Salah's work. He was a universally known and accepted authority on Usul al-Hadith.
and just although it is not directly related to the subject of science of hadith since now you have come to know what is the stature of imam ibn salah all imams whether this is imam nawawi then afterward comes imam asqalani whether his teacher his sheikh imam zainuddin al iraqi in at taqid wal iza or an nukat or whether it is imam sayuti or it is imam sakhawi all great authorities of usulul hadith who came afterwards directly or indirectly they had summarized the books of imam ibn salah in usulul hadith so this was always used as the text authentic text after keeping this thing in your mind i will just i want to quote something from muqaddama of imam ibn salah although it is not directly related to the subject of science of hadith but it is to dispel some other kind of misunderstandings and all these imams which i have quoted their aqida was ahlus sunnah and they believed in awliya and they believed in maulid milad and they believed their faith and aqida was our faith and aqida is 100% in accordance with the aqeedah of all these imams but this reality can only be appreciated by a person who will go through their books and if there are some people and scholars and speakers they don't need to go through their books they don't need to study they don't need to read and just they give the speech they deliver the speech and they become angry and out of anger they just keep on giving verdicts and fatwas without going through their writings then what why we can say i am quoting a specific reference from imam ibn salah muqaddama and this is very interesting page 236 muqaddama of imam ibn salah published in beirut 236 very interesting reference i never never read in my life in any other book if anybody else had never mentioned and quoted this reference which i am giving to you now this is just outcome of my own studies he has fixed a chapter on marifatu autan al ruwad there is a chapter on the various cities and the transmitters belonging to various cities there he mentions imam abu hafs umar bin muhammad bin al ma'mar imam ibn salah he mentions that how the riwaya of sahih muslim came down to us how sahi muslim was transmitted and transformed to us and he mentions ana faqih al haram haddas amba ana faqih al haram masjid al haram abu abdullah bin al fazl al farabi and he is the sheikh of imam nawawi yani from shuyukh of imam nawawi the third generation shuyukh among the shuyukh of imam nawawi Imam Ibn Salah is quoting that this thing has been reported by Imam Abu Abdullah bin Al Fadl Al Farabi. He says that I read Sahih Muslim under my Sheikh. I did Kira'a of Sahih Muslim, and he did Sama from me, and I did Kira'a on him from him. and got ijaza of say muslim and for this purpose my sheikh imam farawi says my sheikh took me to the grave of imam muslim and i did qiraa of jami as sahih al muslim on the grave of imam muslim he says it happened two times 
ذالک مرتا على راس قبر مسلم ابن الحجاج ون ٹائم آئی ڈیڈ کرا آف سی مسلم سٹنگ آن دا ٹوورڈز دا ہیڈ ان دا گریو آف امام مسلم آن دا ہیڈ سائڈ اینڈ سیکنڈ ٹائمز ہی اگین سیز ان دا قبر مسلم ان ایدن سیکنڈ ٹائم اگین وی سیٹ ایٹ دا قبر آف دا گریو آف امام مسلم اینڈ وی ڈیڈ کرا آف سی مسلم اینڈ گوٹ اجازہ دا کویسچن از اف گوئنگ ٹو دا قبور and going to the graves of aima is a bid'ah then what they were doing there on the grave of imam muslim was qira of say muslim not possible in a mosque the qira of say muslim was not possible in the halaqa of ilm the aima and shuyukh who reported say muslim to us and who are the authorities and the reliable sources the chains on which everything relies upon they for the purpose of reciting reading the jami as sahi lil muslim they are going on the grave of imam muslim why to get the baraka from the grave of imam muslim to get the baraka of imam muslim through his grave this was the aqeedah of imam ibn salah the aima of usul al hadith And then comes Imam Zain al-Iraqi. Then comes Imam Ibn Kaseer. Who wrote Ikhtisar Ulum al-Hadith and Al-Ba'is al-Hasis. Then Imam Zain al-Din al-Iraqi. He wrote An-Nukat ala Ibn Salah. And again Imam Ibn Hajar al-Skalani. Again he wrote An-Nukat ala Ibn Salah. It is also here An-Nukat ala Kitab Ibn Salah. By Imam Ibn Hajar al-Skalani. Then comes Imam Jalal al-Din Suyuti. who wrote At-Tadrib and Al-Fiyah, Nazmud Durar Fi Ilm Al-Asar and man, many other books. And Imam Asqalani wrote Nukhbatul Fikr. This was in fact the commentary on Nuzhatul Nazr. So then comes Imam Abu Lassan Al-Jirjani, then Muhammad Futu Ilah, Muhammad Futu Al-Baiquni and Abu Abdullah Muhammad bin Abdul Baqi Al-Zurqani who wrote Sharu Zurqani Alal Manzuma Al-Baiquniyah. Then up to our period, this 14th century Sheikh Tahir al-Jazairi and Sheikh Jamaluddin al-Qasimi from Damascus who wrote Kawaid al-Tahdis. So this is a history of the books written on Usul al-Hadis. And Wallah, I have gone through all of these books, books of these Imams. And I have never, and I have not found even a single one Imam among the whole history who possesses the Akidah other than ours. After the introduction of this history of Usul al-Hadith, now I will come to the categories of Hadith. Hadith al-Sahih, Hadith al-Da'if, Hadith Rasul Hassan, Hadith Al-Da'if and these things. There is a, again a very big confusion in this concept. And the people have not properly understood. Let me explain first of all these things. The people think that Al-Hadith Al-Sahih means whatever is reported in Bukhari and Muslim. or whatever is reported in Bukhari or whatever is reported in Bukhari and Muslim that is Sahih this is again ignorance of the science and knowledge this is again a very big jahala the sihat of hadith acceptability of hadith the strength of hadith or da'af of hadith All these things have nothing to do with any book. Whether any hadith is contained in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim or not, it does not imply that we don't accept. Because Imam Bukhari and Muslim both have not 
comprehended all ahadith of sahiya in their books just if you try this is the first point i want to dispel this misunderstanding those people who say just if you discuss on any particular subject they say just show us in bukhari this word this statement is jahala itself nobody in 1200 years i am talking with full responsibility and what i say inshallah taala you won't find a single reference in any single book against what i state today again there is a big fitna if you quote any hadith they say just show us in from sahih bukhari we don't accept anything else this statement is one of the biggest jahala ignorance in the last 1200 years since jami as sahih al bukhari was written from the day of so imam bukhari and from the days of imam muslim till today no not a single imam not a single authority of ilm al hadith not a single authority and imam of usul al hadith has ever stated this kind of silly thing nobody has ever stated this kind of thing this is just a silly remark remark based on an ignorance based on illiteracy based on lack of knowledge i am again repeating right from imam bukhari and muslims days up till today you can consult 100 books written on usul al hadith or more than that you can take any book written on usul al hadith it was never stated in the last 1000 years or 1200 years that show me in sahih bukhari provide us if there is any hadith in sahih bukhari and we don't accept any other book this is a sentence which was never uttered in 1200 years of history now are you clear on this particular point this is again a fitna of the present time and fitna of jahala the people they never read the subjects they never go through the sciences they never go through the classical knowledge they never read the basic classical authorities on the subject they don't know what is the exact stands this is just creation this is bidah this is bidah to say in knowledge to say just we don't accept other than bukhari this is a very big bidah in the ilm al hadith none of the imams neither from mutaqaddimin up to mutaakhirin none of the imam not a single person including allama ibn taymiyah including allama ibn kasir including allama ibn ibn al qayyim including allama shaukani none of the aima and authorities has ever stated this kind of thing. this is first thing which you should always keep in your mind and second thing is that the sahih of hadith has no concern with the book this is related to the quality of chain of transmitters this is something related concerned with the quality of the chain of transmitters with the quality of transmission with the quality of the afrad the people the transmitters and not related to the books only unique character which is possessed by sahi bukhari and sahi muslim only the unique character possessed by these two books is that there is a consensus of ahlul ilm that whatever is reported in sahi bukhari and sahi muslim that is definitely sahi only this is not vice versa whatever is reported whatever is contained in sahi bukhari and muslim that is definitely sahi but it does not imply and it does not mean that all sahi ahadith are contained in sahi bukhari and muslim 
and whatever is not contained in Bukhari and Muslim that is ghairu sahih that is totally wrong to say any hadith which is not contained in Bukhari and Muslim is not sahih saying this would be ghair sahih saying this would be ghair sahih this saying this would be wrong and this is the first point which I want to elaborate before we come to the classification of Hadith of Sahih, Hasan, Daif, Modu and others. The first thing I will just quote from various books. I will keep on quoting from various books. Since I have introduced Imam Ibn Salah, the text of Usulul Hadith, the authoritative text of Usulul Hadith. It's page 15 and 16. Imam Ibn Salah, the authority on Rasulul Hadith. He writes, now I am giving the references on this particular point. That what is the position of Bukhari? If any Hadith is not included in Bukhari and Muslim, whether it should be considered as Ghair Sahih, or not. So this is the first point which we are discussing. Imam Ibn Salah says, page 15, and he has created the caption, Ar-Rabi'ah, fourth heading. He says, Lam yastu'iba as-sahih fi sahih hima walal tazama bizalik. This is the capital heading of the subject which Imam Ibn Salah has made. This is the heading of the article, heading of the chapter you can say. He says that Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim both, they have not arranged and they never intended to arrange. They never intended to arrange. All Sahih books, all Sahih Ahadith should be contained in their books al jami as sayyid al-Bukhari and al jami as sayyid al-Muslim. This was never intention of Bukhari and Muslim. And they never comprehended all ahadith of ahadith as sayyid in their books. So these two books are collections, not comprehension. Whatever is contained in Bukhari and Muslim is definitely sahih. When there are thousands and thousands of other ahadith, they are also sahih, but not contained in Bukhari and Muslim. Because this was not the plan of Imam Bukhari and Muslim. This was not the intention of Bukhari and Muslim. This was not the arrangement of Bukhari and Muslim. This was not the purpose of compiling these two books that every sahih these should be contained in our books. They never intended, they never thought of that. And then Imam Ibn Salah says, Fakad Ruvina Anil Bukhari. Ibn Salah himself quotes Imam Bukhari. Now I am quoting the words of Imam Bukhari himself. So, where should we rely upon? On our imaginations or on the statement of Imam Bukhari itself? He quotes here the Imam Bukhari's statement. And he says, Anil Bukhari annahu qal, ma adkhaltu fi kitab il jame illa ma saha, wa taraktu min as-sahahe li malal al-tool. He says two things in his statement. He said, whatever I have quoted in Sahih, my jame as Sahih, my book Bukhari, that is definitely Sahih. And to avoid from big length and to make and to avoid from becoming a very voluminous book, I have avoided from many, many ahadith as sahiyah which I have not contained in my book. And I have left many siha ahadith as sahiyah so that it should be, you can say, a handy book. It may become a handy book. And then Imam Ibn Salah 
quotes the statement of Imam Muslim also. Imam Muslim also says, "Laisa kullo shayin indi sahihin vadaatu huha huna." Categorically, Imam Muslim said, and his statement is in the text of Sahih Muslim also. This statement, which Imam Ibn Salah is quoting, this Imam Muslim has written down with his own hands in the text of Jami as Sahih Lil Muslim. In the text of Muslim, at one place in Kitab al Salat, in Kitab al Salat, Imam Muslim himself has written this statement, which has been related by Imam Ibn Salah. He says, Imam Muslim said that all those ahadis which are sahih according to my knowledge and I accept and declare them to be sahih but I have not included all sahih ahadis in my book. So these are two clear and explicit declarations of Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim on this particular subject one. Now Imam Nawawi we will take books one by one. Imam Nabavi writes in at taqrib page, he starts this subject from page 54, 55, up to 58. And this is taqrib with commentary of tadrib of Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti. But first I am quoting the text of Imam Nabavi's taqrib. This is at taqrib ma'at tadrib. I am quoting Imam Nawawi from the text of at taqrib These are the words which Imam Ibn Salah quoted, but these are repeatedly quoted by Imam Nawawi in his at taqrib Imam Nawawi says, Walam yastaw'iba as-sahiha walal tazamahu. This is a basic principle which every Imam has quoted and declared. That Imam Bukhari and Muslim both, they did not comprehend all ahadith sahiyah in their books. Walal tazamahu. And nor this was their plan and intention. They neither, they neither contained, included all ahadith sahiyah in their books. And nor this was their intention and their program and their plan. And now the same wording which Imam Ibn Salah has given. Imam Jalaluddin Suyuti has also given in at tadrib and he quotes from Imam Muslim that when he narrated a hadith in Kitab salah somebody asked, one of the students of Imam Muslim asked him, O oh Imam, Imam Muslim student asked him, O oh Imam, what do you say about the hadith reported by Abu Huraira when Quran is recited then you should remain silent. This is Quranic verse. When Quran is recited, then you should remain silent. Just listen to Imam. Just listen to him. One of the students of Imam Muslim asked him, O oh, Imam Muslim, what is your opinion about this hadith which is reported by Hazrat Abu Huraira? Imam Muslim said, this hadith according to my knowledge, is definitely sahih. This is a sahih hadith. He said categorically. Then same student asked the second question, if this is hadith sahih according to you, then why you have not reported this hadith in your book al jami as sahih Why you have left this hadith to report? Why you have not included and contained, this hadith is not contained in your book. This was second question. This whole thing comes in Sahih Muslim's text in Kitab al-Salah of Muslim Sharif. And Imam Muslim says, answering his second question, which I have quoted, he says that I have written this book al jami as-Sahih, and it does not mean that all those ahadith which are sahih to my knowledge, I have included all ahadith sahih in my book al jami as sahih I have taken some and I have left some of these. 
अदरवाइज इट वुड हैव बिकम ए वेरी वेरी बुक वेलुमिनस बुक ऑफ अदीज सो वी हैव सिलेक्टेड सो इमाम बुखारी एंड मुस्लिम स्टेटमेंट्स डिक्लेयर द फैक्ट दैट देयर आर थाउजेंड्स एंड थाउजेंड्स ऑफ अदर अहादीस विच आर डेफिनेटली सही अकॉर्डिंग टू इमाम बुखारी एंड अकॉर्डिंग टू इमाम मुस्लिम बोथ and they themselves have declared but they have not included those ahadith sahiha in their book for certain reasons otherwise it would have become book consisting of many many volumes this is reported by imam nawawi as well as imam suyuti and further quoting just what is the standard of hadith sahih then This has been explained by Imam Ibn Salah in his Muqaddimah and Usul Ulum Al Hadis, and the same has been reported by Imam Nawawi in Taqrib, and the same definition and the same description has been given by hundreds of Aima of Usul Al Hadis and hundreds of authorities of the science of Hadis, without any dispute and without any difference of opinion. What do they say? They say on page Imam Nawawi writes on page seventy three in At Takrib with At Tadrib that if you want to know about Hadith is Sahih, Imam Ibn Salah said this thing and Imam Nawawi repeatedly is reporting the same and Imam Syuti is interpreting the same. Aima of Usul al Hadith say. and i quote imam nawawi and imam ibn salah both they say that as sahih aqsamun now we are not talking of hadith e hasan we are not talking of hadith daif just we are concentrating on hadith as sahih just explaining the first question that this is not a standard to say a standard thing that only those ahadith which are contained in sahih bukhari or sahih muslim they would be taken as sahih and which are not included in bukhari and muslim they are not taken as sahih this would be totally wrong to say because all aima of usul al hadith the unanimously agree upon the principle that there are seven kinds of hadith e sahih first of all imam hakim he says there are 10 kinds of hadith e sahih imam hakim the authority on hadith in his book al madkhal he writes there are 10 kinds of hadith e sahih five of these 10 kinds are unanimously agreed upon and about the other five kinds of sahih ahadith there is difference of opinion among various imams so he mentions 10 categories of hadith e sahih five unanimously accepted by everyone and about the other five there is some disagreement and difference of opinion among the scholars but this standard of evaluating a hadith e sahih <coughs> or categories of hadith e sahih this is a unanimous standard no imam has ever differed with this and you will not find a single difference of opinion and single disagreement by a single imam in the whole history of usul al hadith on that particular principle which i am quoting now imam ibn salah and imam nawawi says asahiyu aqsam there are seven kinds alaha muttafaqa alayhi al bukhari wa muslim there are seven categories of hadith e sahih first category is muttafaq alayhi hadith which is unanimously reported and transmitted by bukhari and muslim both in their books it is known as muttafaq alayhi this is the first category of hadith e sahih number 2 according to this unanimous principle of science principle of science of hadith number 
سما ما انفارد اب ہل بخاری یو سیکنڈ کیٹیگری او حدیث صحیح از وچ از ریپورٹڈ جسٹ بائی بخاری اینڈ نوٹ ریپورٹڈ بائی مسلم مسلم ہیز نوٹ ریپورٹڈ دیٹ حدیث ان ہز بک جسٹ بخاری ہیز ریپورٹڈ تھرڈ کیٹیگری او حدیث صحیح سما مسلم ما انفارد اب ہی مسلم جسٹ امام مسلم ہیز ریپورٹڈ دیٹ حدیث ان صحیح and Imam Bukhari has not quoted and reported that hadith that is still sahih now number four fourth category summa ala sharte hima the fourth category is that neither Bukhari reported that hadith nor Muslim still it is hadith sahih which was not reported by Bukhari and Muslim both some other imam has reported in his book but the chain of the transmitters of that particular hadith is sahih according to the conditions fixed by bukhari and muslim both ala shart hima that hadith is known to be sahih according to the conditions fixed by both bukhari and muslim but not taken by bukhari and muslim in their books some other imam for example imam abu daud reported that it was neither in bukhari nor in muslim imam tirmizi reported that nasai reported that ibn maja reported that imam abdul razzaq he was before bukhari and muslim he reported that imam abu yala reported that imam ibn abi shayba reported that imam azam abu hanifa reported that imam malik reported that ahmad bin hanbal reported that imam shafi reported that Imam Bazar reported that hadith. Imam Hakim reported in Mustadrak. Ibn Hibban reported in Sahih. They have mentioned various names that these dozens of these books of hadith also contain a hadith Sahih. Except a very few ones. Except a very few ones. Other than Bukhari and Muslim. But they say the fourth category of hadith Sahih is that neither Muslim nor Bukhari reported that hadith in their books that hadith was reported in some other book but according to the conditions fixed by that chain fulfills the conditions fixed by Bukhari and Muslim so now you come to came to know that there is a fourth category of hadith sahih which is neither in Bukhari nor in Muslim but this is also sahih according to the conditions of Bukhari and Muslim then comes the fifth category of hadith sahih and that is that is again reported by some other imam neither by bukhari and nor by muslim some other imam reported that hadith in his book but that chain of the transmitters of that hadith fulfills the conditions of being hadith sahih according to imam bukhari just this is the fifth condition and sixth category of hadith is sahih is that some other imam reported that hadith this was neither in bukhari nor in muslim and that hadith its chain of narration chain of transmitter fulfills the condition of saha of sahih according to imam muslim and not according to imam bukhari that fulfills the conditions of muslim and not the conditions of Bukhari there is some difference of opinion between the two that's why they have differentiated either if the conditions fixed by Imam Bukhari if those conditions are not fulfilled in a chain of transmitters and the conditions which have been fixed by Imam Muslim these are fulfilled even then that hadith is sahih which has been taken by some any other Imam because the seha and daaf of hadith does not depend on any specification of a book it does not depend on this question that who has reported who has related who has included and contained in his book it has nothing to do with who and which it is related just to the quality of the chain of transmitters what category and what standard of the quality of the chain 
this hadith does possess it may be any other imam it may be imam behaki it may be imam tabarani any imam so hadith is sahih and daif has not been confined to imams it has not been confined to the books this declaration is just consigned confined to the quality of the chain of transmitters so this was sixth category not in bukhari and muslim and not according to the conditions of bukhari just according to the conditions of muslim six categories and now there is seventh category of sahih hadith <laughs> seventh category hadith is sahih again it would be hadith is sahih neither reported by bukhari nor reported by muslim neither according to the conditions of bukhari nor according to the conditions of muslim still it is sahih it can be sahih it would be sahih according to the conditions of any other imam the authority there are not only two authorities on the science of hadith there are some dozens authorities too imam shafi he was among the shuyukh why if imam shafi says that this is sahih why his verdict is not to be taken and the verdict of his grand student should be taken why imam shafi possesses and enjoys much higher status than imam bukhari possesses imam ahmad bin hanbal is sheikh of imam bukhari why a hadith which has been taken by imam ahmad bin hanbal the sheikh of imam bukhari and he is satisfied with the conditions of the chain and considers it to be sahih why his verdict is not to be taken and verdict of his student would be taken why imam abdul razak is the sheikh of imam bukhari imam abu daud is his class fellow every imam has its own chain of narrations and chain of transmission so this is the matter of scrutinizing the quality of the transmitters and the quality of the change and strength of reliability of the chain and it has nothing to do with any particular imam or any particular book so he says that it may be sahih it can be sahih according to the conditions fixed by other imams still it is hadith is sahih so this principle which i have mentioned this is a unanimous principle you take any book of usul ul hadith you will find the same there is no dispute and there is no disagreement on this principle it means that not matter of bukhari and muslim there are seven categories of hadith is sahih and seven standards of hadith is sahih which has been mentioned by various imams unanimously and even imam nawawi says that the sayat of hadith can be declared even in later periods also he writes in a taqreeb that the decision of hadith is sahih it is not necessary that the verdict of the sahha of hadith the acceptability of hadith we should get that verdict from those old days of bukhari and muslim and abu daud and tirmizi and if any authority imam reliable authority after his scrutinization after full evaluation after full criticism he is satisfied and declare that this hadith and its chain is sahih it is sahih ul isnad so if this was declared later this would also be compulsorily accepted this is the mazhab of imam nawawi the same thing has been categorically stated by imam ibn hajar asqalani in his book an nukat ala kitab ibn salah imam ibn hajar asqalani says page 152 and 153 and imam ibn hajar asqalani has quoted the same in his muqaddimah of fathul bari also and he quotes this statement from imam bukhari himself 
This is Imam Asqalani who is quoting Imam Bukhari, one of the biggest authorities on Bukhari. Imam Asqalani and biggest, one of the biggest authorities on Hadith and Usulul Hadith. He says that Imam Bukhari says that I learned 100,000 ahadith e sahiyah I learned by heart. I know I have learned by heart 100,000 ahadith e sahiyah. And then he says, and 200,000 ahadith which are ghayr o sahih. This is what Imam Bukhari has stated. And total number of hadith which Imam Bukhari, excluding the repetition, excluding the repetition which Imam Bukhari has included, that is between 3,000 to 4,000. There are various numbers. It starts from 2,500 and goes up to 4,000 maximum. Various aima and scholars have given various numbers. So maximum number, maximum, without repetition, behaz with takrar, there are only 4,000 ahadith in Sahih Bukhari. In any Bukhari says himself that I learnt by heart 100,000 ahadith of Sahih. It means out of 100,000 Sahih Ahadith, he has reported just 4,000 in his al jami as Sahih and he left 96,000 out of this. That's why some of the Aima have stated that among the Ahadith Sahih, Imam Bukhari has left the majority, maximum number is left and he has selected to fulfill the purpose of his book a few up from them. And that's why Imam Asqalani says that those ahadith sahih which are included in Sahih Bukhari, they are lesser in number which are excluded from Sahih al-Bukhari and they are still Sahih hadith. Imam Asqalani says, and the same is the position of Imam Muslim, without, with, without repetition Sahih Muslim is also this book consists of about 4,000 ahadith, goes up to 7,000, number differs, but without repetition, nearly 4,000 ahadith. And Imam Muslim says, I have chosen these 4,000 ahadith from 600,000 ahadith. This is what Imam Ibn Hajar Asqalani said. And he reported the same thing, Imam Asqalani. He says, that Imam Bukhari and Muslim, they never intended and they never planned to include all ahadith sahiyah in their books. The same has been reported by Imam Ibn Kasir. I'm just quoting very specific names. Allama Ibn Kasir, a great student of Allama Ibn Taymiyyah. He says, in al Ba'is al Hasis, Ikhtisar Ulum al Hadith. Imam Allama ibn Kasir also says that in al Bukhari wa Musliman, Lam yal tazima bi ikhraj jami ima yakub sihad. Jami al Hadith is sahih. That Imam Bukhari and Muslim, they never intended and planned to include all ahadith sahiyah in their books. And then Hafiz ibn Kasir says, فَإِنَّا هُمَا قَدْ سَحَّهَا أَحَدِيثَ لَيْسَتْ فِي كِتَابَيْهِمَا He says that Imam Bukhari and Muslim both have confirmed, have confirmed that there are many other ahadith sahiyah which are not included in our books. And they are included in other books and they are also known as Sahih, like Sahih ibn Awana, Sahih Abu Bakr al-Ismaili, Sahih ibn Hibban, Mustadrak al-Hakim, 
and many other books. So this is a unanimously agreed upon principle which every Imam has mentioned and there is no disagreement on that. For example, we have hundreds of references on this particular point because every comprehensive book on Usulul Hadith contains this chapter, contains this article. Everybody has mentioned. Now the second thing coming to the Hadith, the Sahih. Imam Nawawi states a very beautiful statement of Hadith Sahih. You should first of all keep in your mind the structure. What is the structure of the classification of Hadith? Hadith according to the strength and quality of acceptability and grade of acceptability has been classified into originally three categories and Imam Nawawi says a very beautiful thing, Imam Nawawi here says a very beautiful thing he says al hadithu very important point al hadithu sahihun wa hasanun wa da'ifun a very beautiful thing which Imam Nawawi said, Al Hadisu Sahihun wa Hasanun wa Daifun. And Imam Jalaluddin Siyuti, Siyuti interprets these words. He says that you see, he doesn't say the word Modu is not included in this classification. It means Daif is still Hadith of Holy Prophet. Because he says Al Hadith, Hadith of Holy Prophet وسلم, is of three kinds either Sahih or Hasan or Daif. In spite of being Daif, it is still Hadith of Prophet Muhammad. This is very Nukta Latifa. And Imam Jalaluddin Siyuti, while interpreting in his commentary this sentence, he says, "Innama lam yazkuril maudu li annahu laysa fil hakikat bi hadisin istilahan, bal bi zamm wadi'ahi." Imam Siyuti says that Imam Nawawi and Imam Ibn Salah and all Aima of Hadis, when they mention the classification of Hadis, when they mention categorization of Hadis. When they mention various kinds of hadith, and here Imam Nawawi says, Imam Siyuti is saying that look at this point that he says that hadith is of three kinds either Sahih or Hasan or Daif. And Imam Siyuti says he has not mentioned the word Modu. It means Modu is something different from Daif. And he says, why he has not mentioned the word Modu here? He says the reason is that Modu is in reality Modu is not Hadith of Holy Prophet. This is a forgery. This is a fabrication. This is a lie. And wrongly some fabricated statement was related to Holy Prophet Since the person who fabricated that statement he wrongly, he is wrongly declaring that this is Hadith. That's why the word Modu in the book of Usulul Hadith is mentioned as a Hadith. But in fact, Modu is not really a Hadith of Holy Prophet. This is just a fabrication and a lie. When we speak of Hadith of Holy Prophet وسلم, so Hadith of Holy Prophet would be either Sahih or Hasan or Daif. In spite of being Daif, it would be regarded as Hadith of Holy Prophet It is not something to be rejected absolutely. This is a beautiful interpretation of Imam Jalaluddin Siyuti, which he has given in his book, At-Tadreeb al taqrib And then Imam Nawawi further says, about Sahih that if 
in the book of hadith the word ghair sahi is used imam nawawi says and the same has been declared by imam ibn salah because imam nawawi has summarized his book ibn salah he says that the word ghair sahi does not mean ghair sahi some people say this hadith is not sahi now he is explaining what does it mean some people say we don't accept this is not sahi hadith they don't know what does it mean what is sahi they, they know neither sahi nor ghair sahi they are totally ignorant of the terms and ignorant of the basic principles so imam ibn salah and imam nabawi and imam asqalani and imam suyuti and imam zainuddin al iraqi all imams and authorities unanimously they say in their own books respectively when the word is used this hadith is ghair sahi when this is stated he say it means just lam yasih isnaduhu its chain of authority its chain and its sanad does not fulfill some specific conditions which have been fixed for sahi and then he says that it does not mean at other place that it is kadhib if it is stated this hadith is ghair sahi it would never mean that this is kadhib this is lie this is wrong even they say that if it is stated this is daif being daif does not mean that this is kadhib that this is lie this is wrong this is fabricated there is a very big difference between two ends sahi is the highest end of the category of hadith and maudu every daif hadith would never be considered as maudu the one which would never be accepted the one which is liable to be rejected the one which would never be accepted for our practice the one which would never be received the one which would never be relied upon that is not the hadith of daif that is maudu the fabricated one if it is said that this hadith is ghair sahi this meaning would be taken that it means that this is maudu this is rejectable this is not acceptable this is not practicable this is not receivable this is just a jahala i will finish my two days talk with these two examples so that your minds are very clear on this concept for example sahi in categorization of hadith and classification of hadith is the highest level the highest level of the quality the highest standard of the quality of chain not the text that is known as sahi this is a specific technical term given to the highest standard of the chain sahi and when it is stated as for example the, the highest office in the governmental structure in a country is the prime minister's office is the prime minister office this is the highest office for example in a structure of a government so hadith is sahi is the prime minister of ahadith when we categorize the hadith in these terms just to explain this possesses the stature and status like a prime minister possesses the status in his government sahi and the word wrong is not opposite of sahi there is no bracket between sahi and sahi ghair sahi does not mean wrong wrong is fabricated when it is stated that this is if somebody says that he is not prime minister when a muhaddis says hazal hadith ghair sahih ya lam yasih this hadith is not sahih keep this sentence in your mind 
This sentence is like this sentence. If somebody says, Dr. Zahid is not the Prime Minister, Mr. Sethi is not Prime Minister of Britain. Saying this, that he is not the Prime Minister, does not mean that he is not a peon in this country. It does not mean that he is not a peon. He is not a soldier. He is not a policeman. He is not an inspector. He is nothing. Does it mean this sentence? If he is not a Prime Minister, maybe he is a minister. Not Prime Minister, but he is Minister. And the one who is Minister, in the terminology of Usulul Hadith, he would be known as Hassan, Hadith-i Hassan. <laughs> he, is a, he is a Minister, still he is a Minister in the Cabinet, but you are saying he is not Prime Minister. This is the meaning of Hazar Hadith, Ghayr Sahih. It just negates being Prime Minister. It, he can be minister, he can be a secretary, he can be a commissioner, he can possess any other one of the higher officers of the government. He can be a policeman, he can be inspector. And coming too much down, coming too much down, the lowest level, he may be a peon in, a office, in an office. Still he is in service, he is not jobless. Although at a very lower position, but he is still serving in the government. He is holding a government position. So there is a very big difference between being prime minister and being jobless. So Maudu is a jobless person. Nothing to do, no benefit, rejectable. In the same way, other example, for example, somebody says he is not horse of the time. Ghos is the highest position, spiritual position and status and rank held by the awliya. The highest rank held among the awliya. If somebody says he is not a Ghos, so Hadith says Sahih is Ghos in structure of a Hadith. Possesses the stature of Ghos. Possesses the stature of Qutb. If somebody says he is not Qutb, he is not Ghos, does it mean he is a Kafir? Kafir is like Hadith-e Maudu, totally out of the ambit of Islam. Hadith Maudu fabricated is totally out of the ambit of Hadith. It is not Hadith. This is just a fabrication. So if somebody says that he is not Kutub of time, he is not Ghos of the time, does this sentence mean that he is a Kafir and Fasik and Fajir and he is a Bay Iman? If he is not Ghos and Qutb, maybe he is among Abdal, maybe he is amongst Nojaba, maybe he is amongst Nokaba, maybe he is amongst Autad, maybe he is amongst other Oliya, maybe he is amongst Salihin, maybe he is amongst Akhyar. There are thousands other Oliya of various ranks. And Ghos is just one. And Qutb are just three, five or seven. A very few of them are Qutb. Abdal are just forty or eighty. So where are the other, where the other Oliya Allah go? Every Waliullah is not an Abdal. But without being Abdal, there are thousands of Oliya in the Ummah of Holy Prophet present in every time. And very few of them possess the higher ranks. So if the negation of Ghos and Qutb is stated that he is not Ghos, he is not Qutb, he is not Abdal, any specific term this is negated, it does not mean that he is a Fasik, he is a Fajir, he is a Kafir. He may be a Mu'min, he may be a common Muslim, like all of us. He may be a common Muslim. He can be a sinful person. But still Muslim. So there is very big difference between this end and that end. 
and there are lot many ranks and grades and categories of hadith which fall within the category of hadith and they are known to be weak and daif for certain reasons and they are still acceptable for certain particular purposes but as far as the maudu is concerned maudu fabricated and forged one is totally out of the ambit of hadith as a kafir is out of the ambit of iman out of the ambit of islam orbit of islam so every hadith say daif it would be great jihala to say to consider that we don't accept it the sentence we don't accept it just can only be used if some hadith is established to be maudu less than maudu this sentence would never apply then there are many ranks in the system of categorization of hadith and first of all comes hadith as sahih and hadith sahih you know have seven various standards which i have already mentioned maybe this hadith is established to be sahih on the basis of any of these seven standards it is sahih when we come to this conclusion that this hadith is sahih then every sahih hadith established through any other standard it has further two ranks of hadith is sahih has two grades sahih le zatihi and sahih le ghairihi and after sahih le zatihi comes sahih le ghairihi then after sahih there is another term used for acceptable ahadith which are authentic and which are hujja known as hasan again hadith e hasan possesses two grades hasan le zatihi and hasan le ghairihi and hasan le zatihi possesses the status of sahih le ghairihi the higher status of hasan is equal to the lower status of sahih in certain circumstances do you understand my point there are two grades hadith sahih le zatihi is the higher one and hadith sahih le ghairihi is the lower one and same categorization exists in hasan hasan le zatihi is the higher rank and hasan le ghairihi is the lower rank so the higher rank of hadith hasan is equal to the lower rank of hadith sahih so this is a point where hadith hasan and hadith sahih become same and one so it means that then we they, they, they become three cracks first would be the hadith sahih le zatihi and sahih le ghairihi and hasan le zatihi they would be bracketed as one they will possess equal position they both will achieve the same status and the fourth category would become the third one hasan le ghairihi and hadith which is hasan and falls within the rank of hasan le ghairihi i mo hadith say in fact this is daif since this hadith is daif has a minor weakness in its chain and this minor weakness has got the support of other ahadith so because of the support and other reasons this minor hadith daif has been promoted to hadith hasan le ghairihi so it is originally it was daif but it has become hasan and acceptable so many hundreds and thousands of ahadith which are known to be daif in their own capacity but because of the other external assistance which they get because of these supports hadith e daif is upgraded to the level of hadith e hasan and hadith e hasan is promoted to the level of hadith e sahih and there are many ahadith even in sahih bukhari and sahih muslim which possess a minor levels of weaknesses in the chain there is daf and dof in their chain but because of the other supporting evidences they are regarded as hadith sahih and hasan 
and you can find these kinds of hadith in Bukhari and Muslim too. So it means that this standard was also accepted by Imam Bukhari and Muslim. So the people have made a very big deal just hadith is daif then they have created a fitna and a qiyama. It is hadith daif. It means that it should not be accepted. They have never gone through the classical books of Nusul al-Hadith. Daif doesn't mean an Allama ibn Taymiyyah who? Allama ibn Taymiyyah says that hadith daif is like a sick person. He is still a man. And there are hundreds levels of his sickness. There are some severe illness. Sometimes there is severe illness, a severe sickness. Sometimes there is a very severe illness. Sometimes there is moderate illness. Sometimes there is very mild illness. Sometimes there is very minor. Sometimes it's very severe. As a, an ill and sick person is always cured. And there are very, very, this is the last point. There are very few patients and very few diseases which are, which are non-curable like cancer like for example cancer if any daif chain possesses the cancerous problem in its chain like if any daif possesses the illness of cancer that would not be accepted because there are hundreds of Sick people who are ill, who are sick, who have disease, but their diseases are curable. There are infections. They get cured through inter antibiotics. A person who has cold, will you make a person who has just a, minor, a mild cold and a person who has cancer, will you put them together, both equal? He is also a sick person, he is also a sick person. The word sickness applies to both. But there is hell of difference between two illnesses. A person having headache. I was having headache when I came here. So I am sick. I got medicine, paracetamol and some other tablets when I came here for lecture. So I am sick. So it means I am a dead person. There is a lot of difference between an ill and a dead. Hadith Modu is like a dead person. Is it like a cancer? Is like non-curable, uncurable disease. And there are still hundreds of diseases which are 100% curable. 100% curable. Allama ibn Taymiyyah says the same is the case with hadith daif This is Allama ibn Taymiyyah's quotation. Same is the case with hadith daif there can be many weaknesses. There can be many illnesses, ailments, illa, ailments. But still they are curable. Through other riwaya, through other hadith, through other tradition, through other transmission, through other supports. There are medicines, there are supports. When that hadith which is daif gets support of other riwayat and other daif and tradition, so it does not remain sick, it becomes healthy. So it is promoted to Hadith Hasan and promoted to Hadith Sahih. So this is the case of Hadith Da'if. So Hadith Da'if does not mean that it should be buried in grave. Only the dead person would be buried. And the sick person is curable, except a very few diseases. So there are very few diseases in Hadith Da'if which are, which are not curable. So they will not be accepted. And all those illnesses and weaknesses and sicknesses which are curable in spite of their pres presence, they would be cured and then they will be acceptable. And they will be upgraded up to the level of Hassan and Sahih. So this was the summary of the classification of Hadith. <laughs> Oh,